Yeah, well, why don't we just get started? We're just close enough. So um, I live in the um, eastern part of Washington State. I've been involved in sustainable agriculture and uh, social justice activism for many, many, many years. And as I just moved here four years ago from the Seattle area, and part of our um, challenge here is to bring the conversation about food justice and food sovereignty into the to the east side, which is a more conservative part of uh, Washington state. And uh, as I've been reaching out to various people to find out what's happening, I've come across um, uh, a great guy who's named Morris Robinette, who's been, his family's been ranching here in the area for four generations. And he's been involved in holistic management, which is a kind of uh, regenerative uh, grazing regime and way of thinking about managing our uh, agricultural and horticultural systems from the very small to the very large. And out of uh, some conversations we've been having, we realized that it's not enough to work on the farm level, but we need to start working on a regional level to restore ag. So, and not just restore agric agriculture, but restore the uh, both the rural economy and agriculture, and also reestablish right relationship between the bigger cities and the, the smaller towns and uh, farming communities in our region. So that's that's the framework. I also have a, a background in um, online activism and also through my business on conference.net, I've been really involved in uh, online digital identity questions and uh, currency issues. So as so I began to hear more about radical exchange, there was something that uh, our models for the, uh, this bioregional economy need to engage with radical exchange. So anyway, that's kind of why I am uh, hosting this session. So why don't the two of you introduce yourselves for a minute and just like um, where you're at, what your commitments are, and you know, just in a brief way, what's why did you come to the session? Arvin, do you want to start? Sure. No. Thank you. Um, I have to admit that I'm quite green and new to. Um, all of these exciting ideas. And so yeah. I came here, um, I, I guess, far more to absorb than and just have a conversation than perhaps to mm -hmm. uh, share any prior work or, or any revelations. Um, we have, I kind of bounce between um, San Francisco and uh, my home, which is Bangalore, India, and about an hour and a half or two away from Bangalore, just across the border in the neighboring state, we have uh, nine, nine and a half acres. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, of, of a project that, that we call Earth Alive. And the and we're sort of just getting started there. Um, mm -hmm. the, what we have there is a set of uh, um, workshop spaces and op open performance spaces and a lot of open land, some of which is quite wild and um, some of which is uh, is arid grassland and mm -hmm. a small portion of which is orchard. And um, rainfall is not um, high in the region. And mm -hmm. So we're thinking about all sorts of ways to raise the water table, recharge wells, um, mm -hmm. water capture, that sort of that, that side of the equation. Um, mm -hmm. So that's one piece of it. The other piece of it um, really is that we're interested in more just and alternative economies. And so um, lots of questions swimming around on um, land ownership models and um, building equity and sort of honestly, what does it take to not sort of arrive at a place as private landowners mm -hmm. and then manage manage the local boundaries as if you're the landowners there, the lords of the manor, so to speak. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, as, as opposed to 
um, what our models where everyone who shows up contributes, expresses interest, um, stays there, works there, builds long lasting equity, um, mm -hmm. genuine equity uh, in, in the place. So what does what is sort of maybe um, generational wealth building uh, mm. models around that? I, I think yeah. I've taken long enough. I'll stop there. So th th those are my angles. It feels, uh, I feel chills in my body as I hear you speak. There's so, so similar questions in my part of the equation too. So thanks for coming. Max, how about you? There we go. Um, hi, uh, yeah, I, I would say similar to Arvind, I'm relatively new to the radical exchange community. Um, I heard Glenn speak a couple of times and uh, read um, one of the more, I think, inspirational books for for this um, movement being, um, oh, what's that book on high modernism? Um, I can't, I think, uh, Seeing Like a State. Okay. Um, so started thinking a little bit about um, uh, institutional reform um, and um, trying to use my career to deal with um, those ideas. Um, mm -hmm. I grew up in a community uh, pretty divorced from the realities of the modern agriculture system uh, in, in the suburbs of Chicago. And mm -hmm. so it was only when I went to school uh, here in Ann Arbor at University of Michigan that, um, you know, through the pretty vibrant um, agricultural community, I was exposed to um, ideas like permaculture and um, the even the more basic idea of knowing <laughs> who is farming your food. Um, and so um, the last few years for me have been an experience of um, you know, gradual awakening to uh, the importance of sustainability um, in agriculture and um, you know, permaculture as well. And um, I'm at a stage, I think, in which I'm trying to just kind of hear all the words, um, gain some literacy. And in the long run, my interest is to you know, do some of these things in my own um, backyard, um, and also to support the projects of others who are um, working on this in a more regional way. Um, so then seeing the description of your event about an hour ago, you know, I thought um, seems like exactly the kind of thing that would be helpful in that regard. Well, um, I want to say that I'm also I'm putting together a new set of ideas for me. I mean, it's not like the ideas aren't part of my uh, intellectual history and practical experience, but there is a new way that we have to integrate as both of you are pointing to. Um, we can't do it just on a farm level or on a homestead level or uh, you know, individual levels because we're gonna be um, so we're subject to all these huge forces that are pushing against regeneration and restoration of culture in the land. And it can't be just about farming. It has to be about economics and it has to be about culture, right? So both of you are pointing to that. And I'm, I'm really glad to have this conversation with you. So let, I'm just going to run through a couple of um, ideas with you and tell you how this got started and the, thing, the places where I see connections, which may or may not be helpful to you folks. Um, so let me see if I can find my notes here. Um, I tried to close down most of the windows that are distracting, but I think I've closed down the most important one that I need. So give me a second here. Um, So, uh, especially for folks in dryland areas, um, I'm really interested to talk to you more, Arvind. We have some, uh, do you know the term holistic management? Do either one of you know that term? Say that again, holistic? Management. It's, a, it's a body of work that's in practice that's been happening for the last 40 years. It was started by a guy in then Rhodesia, who was part of who was part of the army there during white rule, but was actually helping to move towards uh, uh, the revolution that happened in Zimbabwe, 
And he was noticing on dry land areas, leaving the land fallow actually led to more destruction of the land. So he was noticing, at least in his part of the world, uh, and it's true here in uh, Eastern Washington where it's really dry, that the, the big uh, mammals that used to roam the prairies or the, the grassland in, in Zimbabwe um, would restore the earth by uh, a number of processes of turning up the earth with their hooves, the poop that they made actually created more um, regeneration of the land than just leaving it fallow. It's very contrary to the conservation ethic. So holistic right. management developed first as a, a way of um, uh, tending the range, if you will, by rotational grazing and uh, using intense management of herds on small pieces of land and then moving them so that the, uh, the grass could regenerate. And he, yeah. he noticed that it was really effective and he started teaching about it, but he found that people didn't really get it. Uh, or they got it, but then they couldn't implement it. So he started thinking it was really a management problem that people need to think holistically about their lives, about their communities, as well as about the land and grazing um, management. So over the years, it's become um, a really interesting, it's controversial because um, traditional conservationists and land managers are like, no, that can't be, but there's a body, growing body of evidence, both um, practical and research that shows this to be the case. My friend Morris Robinette, who I met through the sustainable agriculture movement 20 years ago or so, has been managing his ranch that way for the last 20, 25 years. And they did a project um, in the Eastern Washington called Beefing Up the Palouse. The Palouse is an incredibly rich uh, soil, some of the richest topsoil, deepest uh, topsoil in the, in the world. And it's all been dry land wheat for many, many years and the soil just keeps blowing off. And so there's been all these questions about how to manage it. Um, he was able to get convince a guy, he and a bunch of other folks convince a guy who had a 20,000 uh, acre wheat farm to um, convert that to beef management, to beef cattle raising and use this holistic management approach. And they were very successful at it. They called it beefing up the Palouse. Um, one of the problems they ran into there was there weren't enough people left in the region to be able to be hired locally to help manage that kind of intensive process. And uh, all the young people, just like everywhere, are flocking into the cities because that's where the energy is and the opportunity is and there's nothing in the countryside. So we have in this, in the United States, a real push of people away from farming uh, you know, it's the average age of farmers is over 60 now, probably 58 to 60 years old. Um, and intergenerational ranch tra or for, uh, land transfer is very little, even in a place where the land is really fertile. So we have different land regimes and, you know, challenges uh, in our different countries, you know, in Africa and uh, maybe uh, in parts of India, the problem is land gets divided into smaller and smaller pieces by uh, generations uh, having to give land to all your children and so on. In the United States, we have the opposite. We have mega farms that keep growing and that model's being, well, I'll stop there. I have some comments about how that's being translated into the rest of the world. But the point being that uh, Morris's daughter actually was able to stay on the land and actually has formed a great life for herself um, not just ranching, but also creating a cooperative of people in our region who are all sustainable and organic growers to sell locally. So we have some examples of projects that have succeeded here in the region. So I'm just gonna read you uh, a couple of notes from Morris um, that he sent to me. We're working it up into a more public piece, but um, you also, um, may know in the United States in the 30s during the Great Depression, we had uh, uh, the, Roosevelt, the Roosevelt administration um, creating conservation and other kinds of jobs programs. So I'm going to read to you from, from what Morris sent to me. In the spring of 1933, an amazing thing happened in the U.S. The beginning of the recovery from the Depression began, and in just four months, almost two years of depression was erased. 
he had start FDR had started the New Deal, and fundamental to that was help for agriculture. Because of the devalued dollar, crop prices increased significantly. And instead of saving those funds, farmers put it back into the economy and bought cars, tractors, goods, and services. So um, again, our, our times are really different and we don't necessarily wanna go for more buying of things to, to uh, increase the economy. But it was an amazing intervention that really shifted things very dramatically. So, and this was written before COVID-19, by the way. Today, we stand on the brink of another Great Depression, especially in the rural areas. And the answer to more pain is again centered in agriculture. But this time, it has to be a lot different than the first time. So the Green New Deal, which is uh, you probably both know about, um, is a progressive attempt to um, bring those ideas into the current economy and, and move towards a green uh, economy. But we need a more fundamental change than that. Uh, we must see the big per picture from a holistic perspective and understand how one thing affects another. And we must change the way we manage the world and our ecosystems. We doing okay, folks? Sounds good. Okay. So, yep. um, you know, the modern systems approaches haven't been able, we haven't been able to manage the complex systems we have for a long time. We can build spaceships, bridges, computers, and countless complicated tools, but we haven't been able to manage complex issues as, as the economy, the environment, and society. So as we all know, there's these intersecting crises that are happening and we have to figure out some ways to, um, to work with complexity. So in our minds, Morris is in my minds, uh, we need to have this interconnected way of thinking of things, especially around our rural towns and communities. Out here in Eastern Washington, um, a city can be as, as small as 15,000 people you know, up to Seattle, uh, which on the, on the east side, which the urban areas, you know, mil a million or a million and a half um, people at this point. Um, but our small rural populations were more independent 60 years ago, and we could do that again. And what we're seeing is an extractive economy where the dollars that create are created within the rural populations are exported out, you know, first into Spokane and then into Seattle and then into the global economy. So it's true about energy and it uh, ends with the food dollar, which is the basis of most rural economies. So how can we begin to do that is the question that we're asking. So part of it is uh, supporting innovative techniques like holistic management, other kinds of sustainable and regenerative agriculture. Part of it is investing in our small cities um, to help uh, build a, a regional economy. And of course, as we know now from COVID-19 and even before then, most of us, many of us who are in the knowledge economy and uh, global economy can live and work anywhere, pretty much. Um, and so how do we create uh, opportunities for um, a digital and um, bio-regional economy to develop? That's kind of what we're at. So, um, So this is really sketchy, but the rural regions around our small towns can be converted to this regenerative ag with policies that encourage local buying and spending. So how do we not just do farmers markets, but actually subsidize a local food economy like we're actually subsidizing through tax write-offs and other ways, uh, the commercial uh, um, retailing of food the way it is now connected to global food chains. So how do we redirect some of that money to support local, um, local um, buying and distribution networks, uh, including local vegetable farms, uh, which would provide employment for young people. Um, and if we convert the land back to these uh, original grasslands that were in this area anyway, and graze large herds of livestock, it would mimic how the environment worked 500 years ago and 300 years ago, and more traditional farming activity could come to uh, help control the state of erosion that's happening now. So that's that's kind of the big picture. Um, and I'll just say one thing about another body of work 
that uh, a man named Joe Brewer um, has developed, and he's a an American systems thinker who's ended up in in Colombia with his wife and children, and they're part of a a network uh, that's working at the bioregional level to create an uh, interconnected network of permaculture and uh, sustainable agriculture projects that are helping to uh, restore the upper Amazon. Let me see if I can find a, a slide or two here. And so they're, they're thinking about the same kind of problems. Um, oops, I don't have that slide, I'm sorry. Um, so can, anyway, they they're thinking at the at a really large level and convening groups of people who are both indigenous farmers, um, commercial farmers, and folks have come from the global north to because that region is such a rich area for permaculture projects. So that's um, it's just another example of what's happening. So. Um, and I'm sorry, either, his name yeah, is uh, Gerald no, Brewer, Joe Brewer. Brewer, Brewer like a brewer. Yeah, as in, brew, as in brewing beer, Brewer. Okay. Uh, Joe Brewer, and he's on LinkedIn, has a lot of amazing stuff. He's like a complex systems theorist who's like working on the ground. <laughs> so um, I'm looking to him for some inspiration. And uh, in the up here, we're just beginning to convene some radical economists, permaculturalists, traditional farmers who are fed up with, you know, they want to keep their kids on the land and they don't know how to do it. And so we're starting with relationship building. Um, the, so that's the, the second model. Um, and I will, if you want to give me information, your information, I will send you some information about these various projects if you'd like. You can just chat, uh, type your stuff into the chat, your contact information, either LinkedIn or email. Um, but the two other models that I wanted to bring into focus, and then let's see where it leads us. Um, the Indigenous Environmental Network, which is a, a network of uh, environmental justice activists has been working with other folks in the urban agriculture. So they're rural people, mainly right on the uh, Indigenous Environmental Network, but they've also been working with urban agriculturalists in Detroit, Oakland, New York City who are really trying to think about regenerating agriculture in the city. And they have a regenerative model that starts with base building. They're thinking of it as the water for the, for the crops um, and uh, working to network urban agriculturalists and permaculture people together, uh, working on policy development, like what is it gonna take to sustain the networks in the local and regional areas, uh, developing a new narrative um, which that's what I'm really interested in. And then uh, direct action in this case, like how do we get more like what you're doing, Arvind, in, um, in your state in India? How do we get more people on the land and how do we build long-term long -term equity that's just? And also to think about the ownership, what is the right kind of ownership model for this? And that's, I think, where radical exchange might help us in one way, but... Um, land trusts, uh, other forms of collective ownership of land that allow us to sustain for the long haul. And so it's a bit of a spiral, but it's also um, based on a, a natural model uh, or an agricultural model of thinking about our movements. So that's the Indigenous Environmental Network, and they have a really powerful policy paper that this is extracted from. Okay, um, I'm gonna just mention one more which comes from a very urban context. Um, and it's called um, Donut Economics of all things. And it comes from England, but it's being implemented um, in various cities, including Portland, um, Cairo uh, has uh, been playing with this idea. And Amsterdam is the place where this is most developed. And the idea is there's a basic minimum amount of things that everybody needs for, uh, for our existence. And so there's a social foundation and a uh, regenerative economy um, that's in the middle. So the out, if we go too far, we're an overshoot. If we develop too much of our economy and industrialization, all those things on the outside happen. 
And if we don't develop enough in the shortfalls in food, water, health, economics, we're also going to collapse. So what's the right relationship between economic development, um, regenerative agriculture and uh, regenerative economy and justice projects that will allow human beings to exist. And it, it's a really evocative model for, uh, for many of us as we think about, uh, you know, it's sort of Goldilocks and the bears um, story, you know, what's the right, just right amount of all of our um, efforts here. So those are the things that are impacting me and influencing me as we think about this. Okay, so I'm going to stop. And I'm just curious if you have any questions or does it evoke any thinking in you or, you know, I'm also really curious about your experiences in your communities, like what you're actually, you know, what, what's, what are you um, doing um, that's hopeful. So anyway, let's start with any questions or reflection. So a few thoughts mm -hmm. um, occurred to me as you were speaking, maybe three. Yeah. One is this, um, and it connects with this notion of, of sort of the flight of folks from the rural to the urban mm -hmm. um, based on the new economies over the past few mm -hmm. highly industrial decades. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that, that those are important questions around what is, and relationship building sort of centers, centers on that well, I feel questions of mm -hmm. what is belonging, what is belonging to a place feel like? Mm -hmm. uh, what does it mean to sort of feel uh, excited and fulfilled and, and like you're thriving in a place and your life think life is as interesting and, and exciting as you'd want it to be mm -hmm. uh, in, in this kind of hyper-connected world that we're in. Um, you know, what are the things we sort of yearn for? I think these are perhaps interesting questions to, to ask if you're trying to generalize uh, some patterns of why people stay and why people go. Mm -hmm. And in relation to that, I think one observation is that after all this, this flight to the urban, the, mm. the, the sort of back to the landers or back to the earthers mm -hmm. crowd tends to be this younger elite. I've already gone off and made my money in some hyper capitalist. Mm -hmm. environment and now I'm making this conscientious choice to do something else mm -hmm. and it's more of an open question I don't I don't know what what that energy means to to a place does that then make that move seem just as foreign um, mm -hmm. as, as opposed to local or or what's happening there so that's that's sort of one thought. Mm -hmm. um, my second one was, I don't know if you guys managed to catch it, but uh, the previous hour, there was a, it wasn't a workshop, but it was a, it was a panel around charter cities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there were, there were some very core radical exchange ideas mm -hmm. um, discussed there um, around um, you know, the familiar ones of um, self, self-assessed um, valuation via auctions and um, uh, quadratic voting and quadratic funding and, and that mm -hmm. set of radical exchange ideas. But for me, more importantly, what it, what it brought up in relation to what you were just saying around um, donor economics, agriculture, at the center, um, mm -hmm. the rural is, when you're thinking, when people seem to be free thinking on the future of society, the future of governance, the future of mm -hmm. um, sustainable economics, there is a focus on the highly urban. So the conversations are about charter cities 
and the implicit assumption there is that this is going to be a highly technologically energized space right um um a sort of freewheeling special economic zone industrialized sort of mm-hmm. um you know magical place of the urban future yeah with no with not much consideration given to what does what does holistic life look like and and what does it look like if you were to um um acknowledge the truth that it is centered around food systems in some way at least mm-hmm. and so what what your question throws up for me is what are the what are the synergies there in the sense what how do you apply this thinking of 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 uh, charter zones which is essentially a cordoned off border saying inside these inside these ropes we think differently mm-hmm. it's sort of no no more or less than that at the end of the day yeah uh, how would that apply to uh, the settings that that you're working in and and, and you're thinking about uh and then i had a third point somewhere it'll come back to me but i'll stop for now that's really rich um well let's hear from you max if you have anything to say and then i'll res- i have some responses to your arvin and it's making me think and it's also yeah so sure. but, yeah so um arvin i think the first thing you were talking about um with the the sort of um the move from hyper capitalism back to the land as a conscientious decision and the way that that can impact uh, how we might view that decision or those actions um to me that that reminded me of um something that you said bill about how it's important to create opportunities for a digital and bioregional economy to develop um and i was just curious about you know what uh mechanisms you think um mm-hmm. would create those opportunities and what those opportunities would look like um i think you know th- th- you said something about redirecting redirecting subsidies mm-hmm. to local farms away from commercial farms that seems like you know related to that as well um but um obviously uh, there's kind of a broader um yeah. economic question than that and so i'm, I'm just curious if you have particular ideas, um, if you could expand on that a little bit. Sure. Um, I first want to go back to a few things that Arvind said, but I'm, I, I have some, I do have some thoughts anyway. Um, so this question of belonging is really a powerful one. I feel like there's, when I look at, so, my family came from uh, Berlin in 1937-38 as refugees from the Holocaust, as Jewish refugees from the Holocaust. And uh, my mother in particular lived with her grandparents in New York City and always, we had land in Germany and generationally, you know, like my great-great-grandparents. And moving into New York City, we were disrupted from the land. We were the first landowners in that part of Germany because of the history of anti-Semitism and so on. So inside myself, I have this continual learning, yearning to get back to land. And my mom, as soon as she could, uh, got us to a place where we could grow tomatoes. I'll, I'll just leave it at that. And so that's been part of my lifelong trajectory. Um, I'm also part of, I'm 67, so I'm just at the edge of the, the hippie and radical generation that left in disgust to go back to the land in that period. So it's not the hyper-capitalism piece I get, but there's been this continual flow in the United States, uh, uh, mostly being sucked into the city and then a few people trying to escape. And there were different Mm -hmm. economic and political conditions. So it's really important to understand that. Um, And one of the challenges, we come back as colonizers if we have a lot of resources, even if that we don't mean it, right? So going out into the countryside, I bet you were pointing to that in your first statement, Arvind, so I really appreciate that. Um, and thirdly, there's no accident that there's this uh, emphasis on urban living. The International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, and other forces uh, at that level have been saying we are an urban world. 
and really encouraging the development of urbanity in so many different ways, so many trade policies, economic policies, um, the way the International Monetary Fund lends money. The Green Revolution itself was intended, the first Green Revolution was intended to grow farms, not just farmers, but grow farms into larger and get enough capital so people can move into the city. So we're part of these global mm -hmm. forces. So it's not just our individual mindset, although it comes down to that, right? It's like, how do we rebuild a sense of belonging to the land? But there's these larger forces that are shifting us, even if we don't understand that, similar with gentrification. Uh, so anyway, so there's <laughs> those are big questions that I have require right. us to understand our context. So I really appreciate what you're saying. Um, and I think there's a way for us to have bring some of our high tech, because we're delocal, we can be more delocalized now with the high connectivity that happens in my rural area, we have a huge uh, fiber infrastructure that was built um, partially for quote, to try to get industry here, but it also provides the opportunity for people to be online and connected even in really small towns. It's still a mm -hmm. real problem. And it's this the United States is a different context than India or Africa, so on, but there's possibilities for us to have more integrated lives. Um, and I'll just, and then I, after I say that step to you, Max, maybe we can just have a conversation between us all and not just directly for, between you guys and me. Um, so I mentioned, so one of the reasons we think this model of um, revitalizing the Palouse is possible is there's a body of money that is set up uh, in the United States for conservation set-asides. There's a, like $250 million in Eastern Washington available for farmers who say they're not gonna farm anymore, right, to conserve the land. And there's a truth, there was a reason why they were doing that. But we're hoping, and um, we have some ends with our, um, some of our policy infrastructure, to just inklings right now. We're hoping to be able to divert a part of that funding into supporting some projects that are regenerative agriculture. The whole idea of the conservation set aside was, we're gonna pay you not to farm because we wanna preserve farmland for the future. In the meantime, the land, the soil is blowing off or, or running off uh, and as the grass isn't really growing and so on. So we're, uh, and the trees aren't regenerating. So we're looking to try to leverage a little bit of that money that way. Uh, the sustainable agriculture movement as a whole in the United States through its policy sides, there's two or three different policy groups in DC slash lobbyists that have been pushing for um, taking away subsidies for in a staged way for wheat, big wheat, big dairy, um, the large mega farming and to put some of that, more of that money into um, human scaled agriculture. So that's, there is some movement in that direction. And who knows now with the budgetary crises that we have, they'll probably take the, some of the subsidies away, kill some of the big farmers, but not reinvest it anywhere in social systems or social justice or um, agricultural, um, you know, redoing the agricultural models. So that's one thing. And then the last thing I'd say about that is, I mentioned my friend Morris's daughter, Beth Robinette, who, went to a sustainable graduate program, business MBA program and came back and said, I wanna stay on the ranch, but I have to figure out other ways to make money besides just cows. And so she and two of her friends started a cooperative and they brought all the sustainable agriculture and organic farmers together in the, in the region. It's a lot smaller than in the Bay Area or in the Seattle area. There's a lot fewer people are willing to invest in that kind of farming here. But she was able to set up a, a marketing and distribution uh, cooperative that in its first year turned a profit. And now they're selling to the local universities, to local grocery stores, to us individually. And they were able to take some of that money and invest in a barley malter, which is an industrial scale malter for organic beer, making it possible for an organic beer industry to, to grow here. So that's, that's a way that it can be done that way. And then the third thing is we need some local currency and local economic models that 
will support that. So those are the kinds of things that I think about, Max, uh, that are possible. I know there's projects in um, in the Michigan and the Ann Arbor area that are moving in that direction. Um, so I think we got to have policy stuff, but we also have to like think larger as farmers, permaculturalists, cultural activists. Um, like how do we um, create human capital that's going to move from the bottom, if you will, um, and not just stay at our individual levels. Um, I have a little, um, late in my life, I have a little bit of inherited wealth. And one of the things that I'm uh, doing with that is working with other farmers. Um, I, I'm on an acre and a half in my wife's uh, family home. It used to be a seven acre farm, but we're doing some food production and like that. And what we're doing with some of our excess capital that didn't come from farming is uh, reinvesting in our a revolving loan fund that will go from farmer to farmer and like at a regional level, build up enough capital to help each other out. Mm -hmm. So when somebody needs to expand, there's a there's a body of money available. It's kind of like the the it's a very small scale cooperative giving or uh, investment projects that are in India, Africa, and so on. So anyway, those are a few ideas around um, beginning to create some restorative economics. So now I'll shut up. That, that actually reminds me of what my third point that I'd forgotten was, huh? but yeah. pretty much covered it, which is that I think there's a, a lot of exciting uh, thinking that's been going on for a while now on complementary currencies. Yes. Um, even folks like uh, Bernard Later, um, have have been sort of advocating uh, for that for for some time now as a way of mm -hmm. um, taking back ownership. I feel weird about that phrase, but right, um, but I understand. Um, doing that at the local level, um, and one sort of potentially radical way that I um, like to think about it almost as an aphorism in my head just to sort of keep me focused on, on a potentially more radical long term is mm -hmm. how do you how do you get to a point where you can where you can say to holders of the government issued fiat currencies that your money is no good here yeah in the sense that we have a thriving rich um, local circulation mm -hmm. that's fairly self-reliant uh, to the extent that enriches our lives enough that I am empowered to say, you know, I, I see, I see broad crash, but your money is no good here, but here, feel free, you can have this. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. Um, I think we're going to be in complementary currency land for a while. Um, but in order to make, I've been involved in complementary cu currency systems that, that have gone up and have gone down. And I think the challenge is that we don't have the other pieces in place, the culture, the land base, uh, other pieces. So it's kind of like everything has to grow up at the same time. Uh, mm. You know, the folks who are just doing currency, uh, it, it, like Ithaca dollars, for example, is a really great example. But it's never really, it's gotten to a certain scale and it's not expanded yet because the other pieces, even in Groovy Ithaca, I don't think are in place. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there's kind of a friction that's happening that's slowing the money flow, the, the economic flow down. And anyway, it's, it's a fascinating question and possibility. Yeah. Or, or maybe that's an intrinsic property of complementary currencies that might be welcomed, which is that beyond a certain point, it does not grow. It subsides, it degrows. Yeah, and, I hear you. And, and then something more relevant or something more meaningful or more appropriate grows in its, in its stead. Yeah. Theoretically, I'm, I'm yeah. just... No, I, I understand what you're saying. Um, you know, and then with the, the rise of uh, blockchain currency possibilities, there's uh, some chance for more. Um, so the other problem is the problem of scale and um, vulnerability when you have a small system, whether it's an individual farm or a farming community, when there's all these other forces. So how do we create um, the right kind of networks that allow for resiliency? Um, in that, right? So if there's network currency systems or network, um, you know, groups of farmers that are connected to other farmers 
at a distance, how, you know, we can support each other when one part is really challenged or so on. Right. So the, the resiliency questions are, are um, critical for sure. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Um, yeah. So you, you folks have a land base, it's nine acres and it's just, it sounds like it's just getting started. Yeah. Um, so my partner, uh, she's back home in Bangalore right now, uh -huh. uh, but her, um, her, her history is in, in education. And uh -huh. so one of the primary pushes for the space was um, to act as an alternative Mm -hmm. uh, education space for that's uh, arts based, performance based, um, mm -hmm. and land based. And uh, the whole reason that I was sort of pondering um, belonging is is that's from her. She uh, mm -hmm. um, in in her in her education and thesis and thinking um, focuses on uh, on that aspect of, of both education as well as social mm -hmm. structures. Um, sense of um, place-based education and, and belonging. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, we're just we're getting started over there. Uh, and uh, wow. we'll, we'll stay in touch and I'll keep you guys posted on what happens. I'd love, yeah, I'd love to stay in touch with that. Um, yeah, I mean, it's creating an autonomous zone in a, in a certain way, right? We're connecting to a place, building a, a food production system and hopefully good connections with the local folks. Uh, right, there's a lot. Right. What, what, what does an autonomous zone with highly permeable borders look like? I yeah, think. exactly. Right, right, right. So here, one of the slides I was going to show you, I'm just not prepared well enough, is uh, in Seattle area, you probably you may have heard that we have an autonomous zone that's uh, on the top of Capitol Hill, which is like one yeah, of the Chaz. culture. Yeah, Chaz, now CHOP. Um, I forget what it stands for, but um, there is a guy who's an urban farmer, African-American guy, who has started um, a garden in the center of Cal Anderson Park, uh, which is also the head center of the gay community in town. And so they're actually growing food in the middle of this autonomous zone, not, obviously not enough to feed people, um, certainly right. not, you know. So, so there's, it's really interesting to, to see that coming in, into being. Again, autonomous zones in Europe have come and gone as the forces of hypercapitalism, as you were mentioning, uh, decide they need that, those spaces again. But I think um, being able to create a place which is permeable, but also connected, it sounds like, right? I mean, did, uh, did you or your partner come from the area where the farm is or close to it, or are you both more close. urban people? Yeah, cool. Um, we're definitely urban people. We're born and brought up in Bangalore, which is um, okay. at the time a city of about 9 million and then grew to 12. And now if you look at the greater Bangalore area, it's 18 million people. Oh my goodness. So, <laughs> it's overwhelming. Uh, so yeah, it is. It's, it's, it's definitely overwhelming in, in that sense. So hyper urban, you could say, but a very different kind of um, urban, obviously. It's not, a, not necessarily a high tech urban, although there's, there's yeah. definitely pockets of that. Totally. Um, there's lots of swallowed villages, um, mm -hmm. lots of um, lakes that have been plastered over for development. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, so even within Bangalore, there's a lot of questions of um, regenerating connected water systems and um, mm -hmm. the water table, and because water is going to become a issue soon yeah. if it isn't already. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Well, let me let me raise. Think, where, oh, sorry, go, ahead. go ahead. No, you go ahead. Um, one thing that occurred to me is, and I, I guess there's this um, sustainability and environmentalist canon almost that um, that densification, urban densification, is a is a direction, right? And um, and folks like World Bank and IMF, uh, uh, at least in an effort to pay lip service to environmentalism and right uh, in that bizarre uh, way, yeah, yeah, in that bizarre way, sort of pick up on that. And I think this narrative of ac active holistic um, management mm -hmm. of open land and rural land sort of counterpoints that 
quite relevantly and quite nicely in, in the sense that it's, it's a fair question to ask why urban densification is automatically assumed to be uh, green. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's, you know, the, the energy arguments, the water, you know, there's all this, these arguments, but- Garbage, sewage. It, yeah, but we're creating this monsters, right? Like these huge cities that will just continue to suck resources from the rural area and dump waste out into the rural area. You know, there's a long ways from being a um, eco-cycle city <laughs> where everything is maintained within it. Mm -hmm. um, and this urban futurism is really scary to me. Um, I, there's one other contradiction I just wanted to point out to something that you were talking about, about in the charter city idea. Um, so here in Washington, Eastern Washington, we have a movement that's coming from the extreme right. And it's been in different forms over the years, but they wanna create a liberty state where we all think the same. So cutting off the borders at say the, either the Columbia River, which is about halfway across or the mountains that lead into the Seattle area and everything east of there and into Idaho becomes a part of a liberty state, which has conservative values. Um, you're, if you're Jewish or black or uh, otherwise a person of color, you're welcome to stay as long as you recognize that there is a superior <laughs> race. Um, it's right. really crazy. And so the challenge that I have around um, the charter city idea is, you know, I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to promote those ideas to the folks here who are act actively moving for that. They're not going to get very far, but I can tell you more. We yeah. have our militia in the street here in uh, in the Spokane area, right. as well as you know Eastern Washington and even in Seattle. Somebody just got shot on Capitol Hill, possibly due to um, white wing white right wing um, folks who want to take back Capitol Hill right. from the autonomous zone. So right. we have a lot of forces at play. Um, so I'm curious about how our radical exchange friends would would speak to that. You know, like, right. Um, right. And yeah, so, seems just one one thought that occurred to me when we were having this conversation is um, it seems that I mean clearly at the regional level this is less important, but at the state level in the U.S. Um, specifically and at the federal level for the U.S., it mm -hmm. seems like. Um, it would be important to build political coalitions with other um, uh, political movements that that would um, be willing to adopt some policy. For for instance, the subsidy um, mm -hmm. uh, the, the subsidy redistributions, right? Um, yeah. And so it's interesting. It is interesting that there's some overlap with like the. Um, Green New Deal being the best example between, you know, kind of uh, national level uh, capital D Democrats and progressives uh, mm -hmm. with this kind of thing. But at the same time, you know, I would I would also think that those are kind of the champions of this urban futurism idea as well. So it's there's some interesting political tensions, at least at the, the national or federal levels and, and at the state level as well. Um, that I think we, we would need to cr think creatively about, um, you know, who are the proper uh, allies for this kind of thinking. Yeah, for sure. I mean, what we've been thinking about is like leaving Spokane out of the picture for the moment and going directly to a couple of the small towns that really their life is, their economic and social life is really a threat, is threatened right now. And to say, you know, we're interested in what we can do together to help maintain that that way of life, rather than saying we're going to like reject, you know, start with a whole um, environmentalist or sustainable ag or left wing language, because that's that's not going to go very far. Mm -hmm. I first started coming over here in 1996 when we were fighting genetically altered wheat as part of the sustainable ag movement. And I'd, you know, be talking to wheat farmers, uh, you know, who are 
very conservative politically and they they saw my, my hair was even curlier and I probably had a beard at the time and they were like, oh, you're a 206 here, I can tell. That's our area code over here in, in Seattle. And after a while we started talking about corporate control and they were like, yeah, we hate those guys telling us how to grow our food, and, you know, because the way the seed, uh, GMO seeds are under contract and you have to grow them in a certain way. So we were able to make common ground, but it took us like four or five times going over and just talking and listening to what's on their minds rather than bringing my anti-GMO agenda, you know, to the forefront and like we have to radically ch I change things. At one point I said, I hate corporations just as much as you do, just for different reasons. And we got a big laugh out of it, but it really, you know, I still have relationships 20 years later from those experiences. Um, so it's, it's a long term process. And I know that both of you know that, um, how do we build those relations? And we don't have time. <laughs> That's, you know, in our lives, right. but also in the Earth's life. So lots of challenges. Um, well, we got five minutes left. I don't know if there's any much more we need to say right now. I'm always open to more conversation. Thanks, Arvind, for putting your email in the chat. I put mine in. And Max, if you want to stay in contact, feel free to. Um, and I will be happy to let you know on, about our progress. And I'm really interested in like what's happening in both of your areas. I have some really good friends in Ann Arbor, not surprisingly, uh, um, who are uh, involved in some of those kinds of work um, and others who are just regular folks who are doing good in the world. Um, but, you know, I think, we, I think we need to keep exchanging ideas and experiences and, you know, support each other in this, uh, in this world as much as make treatises and write books and uh, do policy initiatives, <laughs> which is uh, important too, but um, but it's like the shared experience of people that are actually doing, you know, doing the work of rebuilding culture and rebuilding the earth. That's um, really important to me. Well, it's been I, it's been really exciting. I can just say as an attendee of this conference to see the variety of conversations happening under this big, bigger tent of radical exchange and the ways in which, um, you know, these efforts can kind of be harnessed to um, work in a, in a direction together. Um, so thanks, Bill, for, um, you know, giving us uh, some insight into what you're doing. Appreciate it. Sure. And I, I'll send you at least a few references to these various things that I threw out so quickly, just they might catch your attention and um, yeah, um, yeah, wonderful. Thanks so much. Um, Thank you. Okay. <laughs> In uh, my meditation practice, I teach meditation sometimes. I'm. Um, I feel inclined to bow to both of you for your interest in the topic and uh, commitment to the work. So we'll just leave it at a nod. <laughs>